All right. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to speak. Uh, it's uh, always an honor to do this and help out. It's uh, something I'm pretty passionate about. So we're going to talk now about function, uh, stress and contents, and more. So I have no disclosures for this meeting. There's uh, no industry funding uh, for this particular meeting. So uh, I'm a urologist in Orlando, Florida. Um, like many other urologists, I did a residency uh, in general urology, then did a two-year fellowship in reconstructive urology and uh, joined a group here in Orlando in uh, 2000. I've been in the same group since that time. Uh, I did a lot of work in regular general urology, did a lot of prostate cancer surgery. Uh, we were one of the first papers on focal therapy for cryotherapy. Uh, we did kidney transplants. During all that, I did urologic reconstruction uh, and uh, over the years became chairman of the department in our, our hospital system here. Uh, near and dear to my heart has always been prostate cancer and uh, I uh, ran the American Cancer Society Prostate Cancer Support Group from 2000 until American Cancer Society disbanded that a few years ago. Uh, you know, currently I do mainly reconstructive urology and that's what my fellowship is in and, uh, and now probably 80 to 90 percent of all of my work is reconstructive urology. So a lot of that is taking care of uh, men who have gone through some of the side effects of prostate cancer as well as some other things. Uh, we're considered a center of excellence uh, here in Florida. Uh, these are the things that we treat, but we're going to focus really on the on things that are related to prostate cancer. Uh, today, I'm going to cover things on erectile dysfunction, just general population information. We're going to talk about those uh, things that are specific to prostate cancer patients and some of the restorative therapies. We'll talk about Peyronie's disease and, you know, what's this about penile length loss. We'll talk about stress incontinence and, uh, and foreplay incontinence and climacteria. Hope we educate you on some of the new things that are out there. So let's talk about erectile dysfunction. So it's the inability to achieve and maintain an erection uh, to complete intercourse. It's estimated that up to 30 million men in the United States suffer from erectile dysfunction. Prior to Viagra coming out, only about 10 to 20 percent of uh, men saw treatment uh, and now that's uh, very different and uh, much easier to talk about. So what is an erection? So on the screen there on your left-hand side is a you know, soft or flaccid penis, which is not filled with blood at all. So it, uh, it, the penis involves three chambers. The two top ones there are, what are the main erectile bodies. And the, and the bottom, the corpus spongiosum, uh, really holds the urethra in the center. But that also fills the blood with an erection and that's connected to the head of the penis. When an erection occurs, which you can see on the slide here, is that blood will flow in through the arteries. So the arteries are right here, the cavernosal arteries and the dorsal arteries of the penis, and they fill those chambers. And that's really, the penis is really a big blood vessel. And so when the uh, smooth muscle relaxes, blood flows in. And then what you'll notice is these little veins, the blue, uh, the blue vessels on the uh, images there, when the erectile bodies fill, you'll have compression of those veins. So blood goes in, no blood comes out. That's how you generate a pressure and you get an erection. And so these are the veins when we talk about venous leak. They don't close and blood leaks out, you don't get an erection. So that's the anatomy of what we're talking about when you look at, uh, at what is an erection. So interesting study, Massachusetts male aging study looked at men, uh, a lot of different uh, conditions, but one they looked at was erectile dysfunction. It was surprising to me when I turned 40 to know that 40% of 40 year olds have erectile dysfunction and uh, whatever decade of life you're in is about the instance of erectile dysfunction. So uh, it seems to be a normal consequence of aging. It's not to say that everybody gets erectile dysfunction, but it's much more common than we think. And this is just men who have not had prostate cancer. It's just all men coming in saying, you know, you have erectile dysfunction. We have some men who are in their 20s have erectile dysfunction. Obviously, that's much less of a percentile. But again, overall, if you look at men in the 40 to 70 age group, uh, about 50% of all those men have erectile dysfunction. So it's very common out there. So what are the cause of erectile dysfunction? Really, the four major risk factors, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, and elevated cholesterol, those are the main risk factors for coronary artery disease. So uh, anything that is good for your heart is probably good for your penis and your erections. So if you can control your smoking and obviously eliminate that, uh, control diabetes, uh, control hypertension, your cholesterol, those are all gonna be very helpful helping your erectile function going forward. We look at pelvic surgery in, in our you know, group, we're talking here, you know, radical prostatectomy would count. 
know, that's a very common cause of erectile dysfunction, which we'll talk over. Uh, a lot of other things, hormone abnormalities, other types of conditions can also affect erections and create issues. One of the very, very interesting things about erectile dysfunction, it's a warning sign for coronary artery disease. So the way uh, this slide reads, if you look at the arteries in the middle of the screen there, you'll see that the penile arteries on our far left, and it's really smaller uh, artery, about one to two millimeters size. And then there's the coronary artery that goes to the heart, carotid artery, then femoral artery. And what you see is they all have a big lumen there, so blood can flow through easily. The very bottom of the slide there, you see what happens when you uh, occlude the lumen by a certain percentage. And what you'll see is that the penile arteries uh, become the narrowest most quickly because they're the smallest artery. So when you have narrowed arteries to the penis, you'll have less blood flow to the penis, you'll have more likely to have erectile dysfunction. So what we find is that men who are young, uh, 40s, 50s, and have erectile dysfunction, that may be a warning sign that, you know what, your coronary arteries are probably also narrowed. And with a little more narrowing, you may get uh, things that would lead to uh, heart attacks and strokes. So here's what coronary arteries look like. You see here, these are critical lesions. Uh, you know, this LED there, that's the widow maker. You know, that gets narrow. Then sometimes, you know, that supplies most of the heart. But these are just showing how those arteries can narrow over time. And you may not know that's happening. Uh, and erectile dysfunction be a warning sign. So uh, this is an interesting study showing uh, from the prostate cancer prevention trial study. They took men who they followed over time, had questionnaires, uh, validated questionnaires. And as they started, these men do not have erectile dysfunction. And as they went through the study, they then developed erectile dysfunction and then they followed them over time. And what they found is that over five to seven year period, these men, once they had erectile dysfunction, they found that uh, in a five-year period, 11% of those men, one in 10, uh, are going to have a coronary event or a stroke. And so it just tells us that if you develop erectile dysfunction, you have about a 10% instance of having a cardiac or uh, a cardiovascular event uh, in the next five years. So again, if you have erectile dysfunction, uh, it's worthwhile at being evaluated for coronary artery disease and vascular disease overall. All right, let's get back to erectile dysfunction. So what do we have for ED? Uh, these are all the different treatment options. So it's not all about just pills or surgery, but we have a lot of different options. And so we want to go through these so you know what's out there. Uh, again, talking about non-pharmacologic -pharma options. Again, things you can do for your general health are going to help your, your erectile function as well as your general health. So again, uh, no smoking, reduce fat and cholesterol in your diet, limit alcohol consumption, regular exercise, and weight loss are all very helpful. Speaking specifically to weight loss, very interesting study done uh, early 2000s, uh, placebo controlled trial looking at men that were overweight and one group uh, ended up getting counseling and uh, educated on how to lose weight. The other group did not, they followed them over time. What they found is that those men who lost 20% of, uh, of their BMI, their body mass index, had a statistical improvement in their uh, erectile scores, in their uh, inflammatory markers, and uh, those endothelial cell function markers that, uh, that they were able to track, showing that if you can lose weight and improve your, you know, your overall health, you'll have improvement of your erections as well. So obviously diet can also help. So anything you can do to improve your diet is helpful. Better than go getting a bag of chips, you know, snack on fruits, uh, you know, nuts and berries. Uh, and these are all just some listed here to tell you what are some of the, the good uh, foods that we uh, use and would recommend. And so in our practice, we have a sheet that we give to patients. So, you know, if they want to make some dietary changes. We tell them like these are the healthy snacks to do. And uh, that little bit of education can go a long way. All right, let's get to uh, what are the specific treatments we have. So we all know about the standard uh, pills that are out there. You know, Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, Staxin, and Stendra are the current pills we have available in the United States. Uh, they work by improving blood flow uh, to the penis. They do it really throughout the body, but they focus the receptors are more concentrated in the genital area. And um, they don't replace anything. They just make your processes work better. So they, uh, and I will show you how that works. So uh, in Florida here, we have a lot of engineers in the Space Coast. And they like to know how do things work. So this is how it happens. So when you look here on the upper part of the slide here, it says endothelial cells and neurons. Uh, those are the nerves. So when you talk about your, your prostate cancer surgery, this is what they are sparing when they do that surgery. So when you get those nerves get stimulated by whatever is that excites you, 
It goes down the nitric oxide pathway. It goes down here and what you'll get is you'll get more of this green box here, the cyclic GMP. What that does, it changes the calcium concentration in the smooth muscle cells and decreases that so that they relax and they open up so blood can flow into the penis. So more of this cyclic GMP means you have more of an erection. So um, that's the normal process of having an erection. The way we don't walk around with an erection all day long is this little purple circle here, PDE5, is an enzyme that breaks down cyclic GMP into a non-cyclic form. And what that then does, that makes the erection go away. So how do our medicines work? Viagra, Cialis, and the like, they block that enzyme. So when that enzyme is blocked, that cyclic GMP can accumulate in a higher amount for a longer period of time. So it's a better erection that lasts longer. And that's how the pills work. They don't replace anything. They just stop the breakdown of your normal, uh, your normal uh, signals that generate an erection. This is another kind of pathway just to show it. And so uh, if you can see my arrow, we're really looking at this very bottom left-hand side of the screen. You know, that's that, and that purple there is that cyclic GMP. That's, you know, that's the way that that works to create the erection. All right, let's talk about the, uh, the pills just in general. So this is a, a pharmacokinetic curve showing you how it works. Sometimes this helps make it uh, more understandable. But at time zero on X here is when you take the medicine. And then this is on the uh, Y axis is the concentration in your blood. And what you'll see is that at about one hour, you get a peak level. So that's when you're going to get your best response with Viagra. And then over time, it you know, goes down and, you know, by out here six to eight hours, it's almost out of your system altogether. But that's the drug absorption curve for Viagra or Sildenafil. Here it is for Levitra, about the same peak at one hour. And then Cialis is different. So Cialis, when you take that pill at time zero, it takes you almost three to four hours to get to a peak level. So we find a lot of men who come in trying to say, I'll say that, that stuff doesn't work. Well, if you take and try 15, 20 minutes later, way down here, you're at the bottom of the drug absorption curve and you're not going to get the same response you will as if you try it three to four hours. So, uh, and then in terms of elimination, it takes longer to, uh, to have that eliminated by the body. And what you'll see is still in your system, you're about 16 to 24 hours later, you still got significant levels. Uh, that's why they call it the weekend pill in Europe, because this lasts for a long time. Okay, so this is a, a, a chart, part of a handout that we have in our office. We've got a, a handout that we use for erectile dysfunction. And again, this is to help men understand how to, how to make the medicines work best for them. So, um, you know, we've got the name of the drug in the far left. The doses are there. We put in bold the maximum dose, so you know, you're making sure you're taking the highest dose possible and then time to peak. So when do you get your best response? So again, helps them to know when they should expect to have uh, their best response. Duration is there, like how long is in your system, then food interaction. Good to know that Viagra and Levitra, if you have heavy fatty food or alcohol, will decrease the absorption so you don't get as good a response. And then listed are the side effects there. Those are mainly side effects of dilated blood vessels. That's what a headache is. So some men will get a headache. Some people will get stuffy nose. Some people get facial congestion. Uh, those are all the things that we'll notice with these medications. And they, they it's really a class effect. Um, the way I built this chart was in the very top is when you take it uh, on demand, like tonight's the night. So you just take it that day. The very bottom there is, uh, is Tadalafil or Cialis, which is a daily dosing of this. <clears throat> and you'll see five milligrams of the maximum dose. You take that. And then in three to five days, you'll have a steady state level where you'll get a response. We oftentimes use that for rehab. Uh, because it may be helpful to have that in your system all of the time. And then we'll sometimes use boost where you take an additional dose uh, when necessary. But just to give you an idea how those work. I think it's helpful, especially here in uh, Florida, grapefruit juice uh, helps to increase the bioavailability of all these drugs. What they do is uh, the grapefruit will, uh, juice will uh, bind to and inhibit the protein that breaks down the drugs so you'll get a higher level. Just have to be careful you've taken cholesterol medicines and the like because they may have a similar effect. So who cannot take these medicines? It's those who have coronary artery disease. Uh, if you carry nitroglycerin or you use any uh, nitric, nitrate containing blood pressure medicines, you know, those really are the big uh, no-nos. And the reason for that is that Viagra was initially developed for coronary artery disease to help dilate blood vessels. They found it didn't work very well at the heart, but it worked better somewhere else. Uh, but it still has an effect there somewhat. And when you take Viagra and you have a cardiac event, say you take it, 
you have the ability to have relations and you have a stress test that you fail and you get chest pain and then you take nitroglycerin, you now have two medicines you've taken. Uh, they don't really act uh, additively, they act sort of by a multiplying effect. You get this dramatic drop in blood pressure and people have had strokes, uh, heart attack, dysrhythmias from that, and that's where we've had death. So cannot use those together. If you do take these medicines and you have any chest pain, we recommend an aspirin, obviously call 911 and uh, uh, the ER can use different medicines to help you control your chest pain. Okay, so here are, this is one of my favorite slides. So we had a lot of men in my practice, I, a lot of my patients are sent from urologists uh, saying, look, this stuff didn't work, go see Brady, he'll, you know, he'll do surgery on you. Um, we take a step back and say, let's make sure you, you're using everything the right way. So this is to make sure you're using all the pills the right way. So number one, stimulation is important. We still have men who come in, they take, a, say, a Viagra, and then they're looking down saying, okay, maybe I'll have an erection. And uh, that doesn't work. You need to be stimulated. You need those nerves to be stimulated to help the whole pathway start. So uh, you got to figure out what gets you excited uh, You know, have these medicines work best. Timing of uh, taking the medication. Again, knowing that you need to take the medicine, whether it's Viagra or Levitra, about an hour ahead of time, Cialis, Cialis, say two to three or four hours ahead of time, you will get a better response if you do it at the right time. Uh, dietary concerns, again, if you're going out and be romantic, you know, it's your anniversary and you're going to have a wine and a heavy fatty food, uh, you know, a nice meal, you know, your Viagra may not work as well. And Cialis may be a better option, but know that those can, those medicines can affect how your, your medicines work. Number four is it requires multiple trials. The first few times you try the medicine, you know, most, most men, they, you know, they used to get a sample, uh, they go home, they take a pill and they, you know, they've got their wife or their girlfriend or partner saying, okay, let's go. You know, now they got pressure for the uh, see how it's going to work. Uh, they may be worried. Are they going to go blind? Are they going to have uh, some horrible reaction? So all that stress uh, works against having an erection. So what we find is that if you take medicines multiple times, uh, you'll tend to do better. You kind of compare over six to eight trials of the medicine. First three or four times, you don't have as good a response to do those last, say, four to five times. And there you get tend to get a better response. So try it more than once. One time would not mean that you're it's a failure. Number five is maximize dosing. Again, you want to make sure that you're at the highest dose possible uh, that's safe for you. Uh, there are some off-label uses at higher doses than are FDA approved. Uh, more common outside the United States where we're not as uh, litigious, but uh, you can consider those as options as well. Uh, number six, again, grapefruit. We talked to touch based on that. Maybe improve your, uh, you know, how the medicines work. And then uh, you may want to have your testosterone checked if it's not working well. Testosterone replacement can help if your levels are low. Uh, so what a good thing to check if that you're not getting a good response. Okay, so let's shift gears. That's that's how the medicines work. Let's we're here to talk now about prostate cancer. Um, you know, these are the treatment options for prostate cancer, starting up here with active surveillance, and then you have surgical or uh, you know, radical prostatectomy, you have radiation therapy, cryotherapy, and high food. So we'll kind of go through a little bit of this. So just to give you anatomically how we do things, and again, hopefully you can see my arrow here, but uh, this drawing shows the bladder here, uh, you know, up above, which is the prostate here sitting at the base of the bladder. And then here's the urethra that goes out to the penis. And again, what we have here is the nerve, the neurovascular bundle. So when you have, you know, your nerve spared, that's what the, your urologist, uh, you know, is trying to do to keep that intact so you have function. But when we do a radical prostatectomy, whether it's open, whether it's a robot, perineally, however it's done, you are removing the prostate here, which is again at the base of the bladder. We remove the seminal vesicles. And over here on the right side of the slide, what we do is that gap, which is where the prostate used to sit, we then stitch that together. So we bring the uh, bladder down to the urethra and suture it, and that's the anastomosis or the connection. We put a catheter in there to allow that to, to heal, but that's structurally how we do that. Show you some of the other treatments for, uh, for prostate cancer. This is brachytherapy, which is where we put little seeds or pellets into the prostate. And on the right side here is uh, sort of the old fashioned external beam radiation therapy. And that's how it used to be done. You lay it on a table in a, uh, a radiation game from above and went back you know, through your body and just hit kind of in one plane. And that's the old fashioned uh, external beam radiation therapy. Just a picture of how we do the seeds. It almost looks like, uh, if you remember the battleship, is you got a little grid and you're putting the, the needles in there and they'll deposit these little pellets. And those pellets stay in the prostate. They're there for the rest of your life. But they'll emit radiation over the course of the next uh, few months. 
so you don't have to go into the office, uh, the radiation oncologist office uh, every day. And if you had an x-ray, this is what it would look like. So you see those pellets in the drawing on the left, and then you can see the outline of the prostate, and you'll see the center. They try to spare the urethra so you don't have as much of a radiation effect there. But that's brachytherapy if you haven't seen that. This is IMRT. So um, what you'll see, which is different relative to the old external beam radiation therapies, you, you'll see you have different planes that that radiation therapy will come to hit the prostate. So that will eliminate or minimize that, I should say, the scatter through around the prostate. If you just came from the front to the back, <clears throat> the rectum sits behind the prostate and that would get a lot of dose of radiation would have a lot of side effects of that. This kind of distributes that scatter effect through a broader range of tissue to hopefully limit toxicity that, you know, that may occur with, with intensely modulated radiation. But this is, uh, this is how we used to do it. I used to do it. Uh, again, people are asleep in the operating room. We put little probes that go into the prostate. And there's little ice balls at the end of the probes. And uh, that would then ablate or destroy the tissue. Uh, very effective. Again, it is uh, very technique driven. And HIFU somewhat similarly, it's a probe goes in uh, to the rectum and that uh, jet, uh, sends a signal uh, to the prostate to destroy uh, the cells that are there, you know, hopefully treating obviously the cancer cells. And that's HIFU. So that's kind of a, just a, a walk down one of the different treatments for those who are looking uh, for uh, prostate cancer management. So um, the great thing about our treatments is all of them work very well. And so it's trying to figure out what's the best for you. Um, so with a high likelihood of cure, you use side effects uh, as a guide to say, you know, what are things that you would be most comfortable using? Um, and I would say the side effects are obviously more common with surgery, uh, surgical interventions. It's an immediate effect uh, that we see. So survivorship now is about improving your quality of life. And, you know, how do we do that? And it's one, we want you to be cancer free. We want you to be potent. That means to have still have erections. And we want you to be confident. We don't want you to be leaking urine. And so that's the trifecta when you look at what are the good outcomes for prostate cancer uh, management. And then again, we don't want to have post-op complications or and we want you to have negative surgical margins when you're taking out the prostate. And that's sort of the pent effector, those five things you're looking for when you're having prostate surgery. So when we look at those as your kind of your guide. Those are the top five things you're trying to get when you have your, your, your treatment. These are some of the other things you ought to consider. And these are things we are learning as urologists to go forward following patients and you telling us what are the problems that you have. So we're going to talk about Peyronie's disease, the length of the penis, and some things that are uh, related to uh, leaking urine at times when we're being sexually active. So let's touch on erectile dysfunction first. So what I did here is I put surgery on one side, radiation therapy on the other. We're going to talk about each of these side effects because surgery and radiation therapy are the most common treatments we have. So with, with surgical, whether it's robotic or open, when you remove the prostate, the erectile dysfunction is an immediate effect. Like you will know that right after the surgery has happened. It is very much age dependent. It will be dependent also on what's your erectile function prior to having your surgery. Like if you have great erections before it, you have a better chance of having reasonable erections later. If your erections are very poor before surgery, surgery is not gonna help. It's just gonna make it worse and you will have a harder time getting back likely to your baseline. The surgeon's ability also will have an effect on your outcome uh, if you receive any additional radiation therapy later on. And then if you uh, uh, work with a rehab program, all those things can help, you know, give you have a better chance to have an erectile function down the road. Radiation therapy, again, delayed effect, does not happen right away. Happens to be with surgery, kind of a drop off right away. Radiation therapy, you do well for a while, and then they, you start to have issues with, uh, with erectile function later. And then those curves kind of cross, where usually about three to five years later, the erectile function is about the same for both uh, both categories. But again, surgery will have something that's more dramatic. So looking at ejaculation, so radical prostatectomy, the prostate is what makes the fluid. It nourishes the sperm. When you have your prostate removed, you will not have fluid come out afterwards. You may have a small amount of, uh, of uh, pre-ejaculatory fluid is usually from urethral glands, but you won't have the same amount of fluid that came out before. Orgasm should still happen. You should still feel that. Um, and it is separate from uh, from erection. So you can have an orgasm or a sensation of ejaculation and be completely flaccid or soft. Uh, most of the time they do occur together, but they do not have to. Uh, interestingly, 10% uh, of men say that ejaculation is more pleasurable after the prostate surgery. I'm not sure why that is. Uh, now looking at radiation therapy, 
uh, prostate still present. So you likely will still have some uh, seminal fluid come out. But as the radiation uh, has effect, and usually it's a, you have the dose, and then over time, the radiation will uh, start to destroy cells. You'll have less viable cells that are in the prostate making that. And usually within three to five years, many men do not uh, produce semen. So that semen, so that, that may decrease over time. Uh, fertility issues, radiation therapy, you have to be careful. If you have radiation therapy, childbearing age, or you can have uh, radiation effects on the sperm. So we recommend not getting pregnant for a year. Um, and there's a little data per se, specifically on orgasm as it relates to ejaculation. So let's talk about prostate cancer uh, and Peyronie's disease. So uh, when you look at men who have had uh, radical prostatectomy, they have a higher incidence of Peyronie's disease than the general population. So if you've had your prostate removed, 15.9% uh, of men uh, in one study had uh, Peyronie's disease versus up to 9% in general population. The average amount of degree of curvature was 31 degrees. So you know, that straight line, 30 degrees would be a bent, uh, whichever direction that is. Radiation therapy, you don't have any data on Peyronie's disease and radiation therapy, so I've not seen that. So yeah, this is a, a, a photograph of a dorsal Peyronie's disease or an upward curvature, something uh, right lateral curvature, left lateral could be downward, we call that ventral. And then some have some just narrowing, we call an hourglass deformity, where again, you have a band of scar tissue. And what happens with this, is if you look here, this is a cross section of the penis and you're kind of looking on end. And what you'll see is you develop a, a plaque. It's a bad term. It has nothing to do with plaque in the arteries uh, of the heart or plaque on your teeth, but that's the name that people have used. It's really fibrosis, and that's probably a better name. And what fibrosis does, it creates a tethering effect. And the way we describe Peyronie's disease, if you can imagine uh, a cylindrical balloon, uh, and then you put a piece of scotch tape along the length of the balloon and then blew the balloon up. Where that tape is, is that same fibrosis and that tape won't allow the balloon to expand. The other side has no restrictions. You have a lo functional longer side and a shorter side so the balloon will curve on the side with the tape. Same thing happens with, uh, with our erections with Peyronie's disease. Uh, and that's really what we see with Peyronie's disease. So again, out of uh, moral stone Kettering, John Mulhall did a study looking at uh, you know, a group of patients. And again, they had a, about a 16% incidence of, of Peyronie's disease versus uh, we see in general population, 9%. And interestingly, erectile dysfunction or function did not really play a role. So uh, just having a catheter, just having uh, uh, procedures done to put you at risk for Peyronie's disease. Do have some treatments for that. Uh, Zyaflex is the only FDA treat, uh, treatment option for that. It's a collagenase enzyme that breaks down that scar tissue. Uh, and it's FDA approved for those who have 30 degrees of curvature, stable disease, and a palpable plaque. Uh, and again, you know, I'm in the sexual medicine side, and there's, there are those throughout the country who treat this. And I think those are the best people to probably uh, at least talk to who have this as an issue. Um, and again, we do this, and usually we'll give you a, a block to numb up the area and just showing it's an injection right into that scar tissue to try to break down the, uh, the, the fibrosis. And, uh, and rarely do we do surgery specifically for Peyronie's disease. We can usually treat it with, with medicines, but some, you know, we still do surgeries on a fair number of it. All right, so let's go then to penile length. You know, what's the story on that? So what we have found is that 70% of men will complain and say that they have lost uh, penile length after their prostate surgery. As urologists, we used to say that, you know, that, that's not accurate. That can't happen. You take out the prostate, put everything back together, and the length should be the same. What we've noticed is that you do have loss of length over time. That's now been shown. Do not see that in radiation therapy. Uh, we think it's related to loss of, uh, of erections. And so, uh, first study that I saw looking at this is 1993, uh, you know, looked at 100 men after a radical prostatectomy. This is before the robot. It was the open prostatectomy. And what they found is that men had a reduction in penile length of 9% and an uh, overall reduction in penile volume of 22%. And then looking at, this is a, a prospective randomized study by one of my old mentors at the University of Miami, Mark Soloway, and looked and saw that in, in almost all parameters, men, the penis was smaller. And overall, what it found is that you likely have atrophy of the penile tissue as you're not having erections. And so, um, so and again, they found that uh, sparing the nerves did not seem to be protective of that. So it is uh, likely a, a bigger process. And again, likely not having blood filling the penis, stretching it out, keeping that tissue healthy is likely what's happening there. 
So how can we prevent that? So it is really uh, being uh, engaged in a rehab program or a prehab program or doing something to get those erections. Erections are good for erections. So as you lose your erections after, um, say, prostate surgery or anytime you lose your erections, you will likely have some loss of your function as time goes on. So men will have erections. The younger you have erections uh, five to six, maybe eight times a night. Uh, you have erections easily when you're 18 years old, even when you don't want them to happen. And that's probably something that helps keep that tissue healthy as you have oxygenated blood that goes into the space, fills the space up, uh, and, uh, and, and keeps that endothelium and that lining of the erectile bodies healthy. So we don't completely understand what's happening, but it is that highly oxygenated blood and stretching probably helps to keep everything uh, functioning uh, optimally. And that's what we want to replicate in any kind of post-surgery uh, rehab program. So, um, so again, overall, again, penile length loss, Peyronie's disease, uh, uh, we do see it in prostate cancer. The good news is that if you do do rehab uh, and you're able to do, uh, be, uh, follow that uh, over time, uh, we find that uh, men do uh, get their penile length back. If you don't do anything, you tend to lose that. Oftentimes, you now the uh, length that's lost. So we want to do that uh, fairly early. Uh, last is foreplay incontinence and plimacteria. And uh, I'd say it's, we've not seen that in radiation therapy described uh, in uh, with uh, radical prostatectomy. We have seen, again, foreplay incontinence is the loss of urine with just simple arousal with your partner. Uh, climacteria is loss of urine with climax when you uh, when you actually have that, that orgasmic sensation. So, um, so let's go to some other things. So these are just other concerns that, again, in our handouts that we give patients, these are things we talk about. So just talking about recurrence. So if you have a prostatectomy and then you have recurrence, you can then do additional radiation therapy. I would say as a reconstructive urology who takes care of people, uh, patients down the line, those patients are less problematic for me managing them for things like incontinence and ED and the, and the like, because they still do well. Um, when you take men who have had radiation first and then they have recurrence of their prostate cancer, and then you add what we call a salvage radical prostate and remove the prostate afterwards or cryotherapy or high food, those patients have much more in the way of severe complications they tend to have be harder for us to treat. And we actually do our surgeries to help with incontinence. We have a special pathway for them because we know that they have a higher complication rate. So we treat them differently. And really it's just that for some men, they're gonna get both therapies. If you got really say more aggressive disease and you have a high chance of having both. Um, and I, I'm sort of a, I don't push people one way or the other. I'm, I'm a surgeon. I used to do a lot of prostatectomies. You know, and I tell patients now, look, they both have pretty equal outcomes. You have to figure out what makes the most sense for you. For those who have high-risk disease and have a chance to have both therapies, my, my recommendation would be uh, to consider the surgery first and then uh, add radiation therapy if you need afterwards. The people tend to heal better uh, in that sort of sequence rather than radiation first and then surgery. And that was really the only that I really sort of tend to push people towards surgery because again, I don't want to have people have problems down the road. So now looking at um, other issues we see down the road uh, in, in recovery. So um, radiation therapy tends to have uh, more so in the past, but still has increased risk of secondary cancers. <clears throat> so the bladder has an has a exposure to radiation therapy as does the rectum. And so, you know, there are some studies that show uh, a higher percentage of those and follow up as you go down the road. <clears throat> we do see dystrophic calcifications, not infrequently in men who have had radiation therapy. We almost never see them in surgery. And that's where the prostate becomes calcified. And sometimes it creates obstruction or blockage. And that's uh, something we have to deal with later. Uh, we do see occasionally uh, uh, bleeding or uh, hemorrhagic cystitis. And unfortunately that happens sometimes three, five, 10, 15 years after they've had radiation therapy. Uh, and again, I will tell you as a urologist, we see that very uncommon with surgery, but more common with radiation therapy. And then fistulas, very rare with, uh, with, with surgery, more common with uh, radiation or combination of surgery and radiation. Um, but again, fortunately they're rare. We do see anastomotic strictures or uh, bladder neck contractures or vesicle anastomosis con contractures. And that's where the prostate and the bladder uh, I'm sorry, 
powder were put back together, you will occasionally see uh, strictures there. I think less common now with uh, how um, surgeries are being done. You can see it also with radiation therapy. They tend to be in the bulbar, urethra, and membranous urethra. Uh, but again, uh, fairly similar there. I would say with radical prostatectomy, we see more lymphocytes, which is uh, they remove the lymph nodes and the pelvis, and those lymphocytes can grow. Rarely do they have to have anything be done, but if you do have symptoms, they can be drained. We do not see lymphocytes with that radiation therapy. But again, these are these are good lists just to say, okay, talk with your urologist or radiation oncologist. They tell me a little about your experience of these and what they have. So two words again, or a few words just on radiation therapy. Again, you know, radiation ser- therapy side effects are delayed. You know, you don't see them until uh, down the road. Uh, and it's usually years. Um, you know, and I think radiation uh, oncologists are great uh, and, uh, and they offer great service. But I will tell you that it's really the urologists who are dealing with these problems down the road. So, you know, radiation oncologists, you know, probably medical oncologists sometimes don't even know that these, these things happen, but because they're not managing, it's us who are kind of treating these problems down the road. So they do see, they do happen. I'd also say that radiation uh, uh, disasters are the worst disasters. So if somebody has a problem with radiation therapy, um, you know, it's a lifelong problem. And uh, rarely do I tell people I have a diversion, but I, I just told two in the last two weeks and there are radiation therapy complication issues from, you know, years past. But, uh, but again, uh, I think most of the time, this is not a problem. Uh, surgery and radiation therapy often go very, very well. All right. So that's just kind of a little bit of overview on, on prostate cancer and what you should be thinking about as you're making your decisions. Now let's talk about what are we going to do to help our erections get better after treatment. So, if you've chosen to have a radical prostatectomy, um, can you do any therapy beforehand? So what we recommend is to get a vacuum erection device before you have your surgery. Uh, try to do some stretching beforehand without a band. Just get comfortable using the device and see how it works. We oftentimes will encourage men to start with a, uh, the phosphodiesterase inhibitors like Viagra Cialis beforehand. Just again, get used to the medicine and the, if you've never taken it before. Uh, and that's shown to be somewhat helpful. There was an interesting animal study done looking at pelvic nerve crush injuries where they, uh, they took sildenafil and they gave dosing along with a crush injury. What they did is they gave it to three days prior to the injury, an hour beforehand and three days later. And what they found is that um, those that had the, the uh, dosing three days beforehand had the best response. So they had a higher intercorporal pressures and the mean pressures in the penis, they were much better. Uh, and, and, the, uh, and they had lower uh, sort of uh, apoptotic markers or cell death markers uh, than the other group. So again, it is probably helpful to prime your erections prior to getting your prostatectomy. And so we, we would recommend that in those who can take those medicines. All right, let's go through a little bit about how do we do surgery. So this is a kind of a schematic or a drawing. The far right side is labeled the bladder. You see the prostate in the middle, purple, and then the urethra is down uh, to the left side. And what you'll see in yellow, those are the nerves, and that's what control the erections. So when you have your uh, prostate surgery, you can do different things. And you know you can ask, what does your urologist do to help protect the nerves? And so they'll do things like athermal nerve sparing, which is they don't cauterize on the nerve. Some people do a special graft where they take graft from the back of the leg and they can put it there. And then they'll also sometimes put um, a tissue that will help uh, nerves to heal. Uh, <clears throat> but the things that will factor and to give you your best outcome for erections are if you're a younger patient, uh, if you've got really good erections beforehand, and then if your surgeon is experienced and, uh, and has a, a good track record, those are probably the three best things to say that you're more likely to have a better outcome with your erections. And so when you have your prostatectomy, you see here the prostate's now removed. You see the bladder is there and the urethra is there and the nerves are now intact. There's, they've not been cut going out to the penis, which is just beyond the, the urethra there. And then when we, <clears throat> we stitch that urethra and bladder back together, we put a small catheter in there to drain the bladder. Again, those nerves have to recover. And what you'll see is you, we have to dissect the nerves off of the prostate. <clears throat> and so they'll have some effect from that. So the nerves tend to go to sleep from the manipulations. Even if you spare them, by kind of trimming the nerves that go onto the prostate and pushing the nerve away, you'll have, um, you know, you'll have kind of a neuropraxy where they will not function and work as well. 
So um, what should we do or when should we start working on our erections? So this is an interesting study looking at uh, how long after radical prostatectomy did we see venous leaks occur? So if you check for venous leaks four months after your prostate surgery, you've not done any rehab, percent of men had venous leak. If you checked the, at eight months, then 30% had a venous leak. If you checked at a year, then 50% had a leak. And so what you're finding that as time goes, you're having more and more venous leak and you're having progression in the damage to the penis that's occurring. So earlier is better. That's your window of opportunity. If you want to have good erections, then you should work on it right away. Um, because again, that's, that's your time to prevent some of this damage that occurs from you stopping having erections and not having blood you know, fill the penis uh, on a routine basis. So ED programs are out there, um, you know, in, uh, in the United States now, some studies show that you know, up to 80, 85% of uh, people are recommending uh, programs uh, routinely. And so I think that's, that's a good, a good sign. Um, and again, so how do we have and looking at measurements of outcomes? So if we take men, and this is men who have had a radical prostatectomy and then treat them with Viagra, and this is study on the early 2000s. Again, this is not a robotic, but a, but a radical prostatectomy. And men had excellent erections beforehand. They had a very good experienced surgeon from the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. Uh, and, and then they looked at if you gave men Viagra afterwards, what was the outcome? 80% had uh, overall efficacy. If you then looked at the nurse sparing status. And so those nurses we show you, there's a right and there's a left. And we can spare both. And we sometimes decide, can you? If your pathology is very uh, favorable, you can spare both. Say you got bad cancer on one side. You may go wide on that side and take the nerve and not spare it. You just spare one side. So um, when they looked at their data, if you spared both nerves, you had an overall 71% uh, uh, response to Viagra. If you spared one nerve, it was really 50%. And then if you went widely and you took both nerves, you'd say, ah, that probably won't work at all. Even still, 15% of men had a response to Viagra. So again, if you've got good erections, good surgeon, and you use Viagra afterwards, you have a good chance of uh, having response. And knowing, you know, when you've had your surgery, you ask your surgeon, you know, how, how the nurse sparing go, we have to spare both or one or, or none. And that will help you to predict, you know, is Viagra and that class of medicines going to work? That class of medicines requires the nurse to be there to be functional. So it tells you about your function. So again, uh, rectal preservation. So interoperatively, your surgeon will, will do some things to improve your outcomes. And then postoperatively, what are things you can do uh, to help, again, get your erectile function back? So one is doing pharmacologic rehab, which are those are the medicines, uh, doing vacuum erection device, and trying to work on the nurse to improve their, uh, their response. So again, what you're going to do is Beforehand, good to take the uh, any of those uh, Viagra, uh, Cialis uh, combination. Uh, consider starting to use vacuum device. Intraoperatively, your surgeon is going to do that for you, and then postoperatively, you're going to work on these uh, these other options that are there. And so, what you want to do with your penile rehabilitation is you're trying to decrease the ischemia or lack of oxygen uh, in that tissue, which then may lead to fibrosis, and then fibrosis leads to the issues that you have. So, again. The PD-5 inhibitors, you're going to use those. They require the nerves to be effective. So early on, Viagra and Cialis may not be as responsive. Now, they are much more affordable now. In the past, I would tell people, look, if you can't afford it, don't worry about it early on. But now these medicines are much more affordable. I would highly recommend being on them if it's safe for you to do that, because I think it'll make a big difference. The vacuum erection device, I think, is helpful. And we're going to talk about use as well. So medicated urethral suppository. Uh, they used to say that it's good for maybe you'll see an erection, but really it's it's a medicated urethral suppository for erections. It's a prostaglandin pill, which is a compound that is a vasodilator. Uh, you place that into the urethra. Uh, it's usually refrigerated. It then melts. It's then absorbed through the urethra to go to the three erectile chambers to promote blood flow. So this is a little cartoon of how it's done. You see the applicator little pellet about the size of a grain of rice. And what that'll do is that, that medicine is concentrated and that diffuses into the erectile bodies to give you your, your response. <clears throat> um, just a word on that, uh, about say 10, 15% of men will notice a significant burning with that medication. So uh, it's good to try that out, see if that's an issue for you. If it's not, I think it's a really great medicine to consider trying. The vacuum erection device, for those who have not seen that before, it's, a, it's an external cylinder that goes over the penis. 
Uh, there's uh, battery and hand-operated pumps. The hand-operated pumps you usually get higher pressure, so I tend to recommend those, but uh, they both work well. Um, to use it for erections, you put a band on the base of the, uh, of the cylinder of the, of the device, you pump it up, you get an erection, and then what you do is just slip the band off of the uh, cylinder, and that would be on the base of the penis. Um, and that's for using after you've had, you know, if you do have erectile dysfunction. Beforehand and for rehab, I really recommend it more for just stretching. I want blood to kind of come in and come out. And so um, so we have a protocol for that, which uh, you know we go through if you're in the office. And you know, here's just a uh, picture. This is actually a patient who's having surgery, brought in his device. I said, you bring him, let's see what you did. And he what he did to, to prevent or get back some of the loss of length, um, you know, he, we measured, we encouraged him to do this. So uh, you'll see there kind of the left side of this line, the penis, that's the opening of the penis. We go in there and that first marker is a little Sharpie marker where he marked where the penis was when he first started doing the vacuum. And then he did it routinely. And what he saw is he kept getting some uh, some improved length over time. And so some men will get sometimes an inch or two of length back that they didn't have. So when we're doing a, a prosthesis, I really believe that that is a better stretch. We can maybe put in a, a bit longer of a device. So we really encourage that before surgery. But again, good to help try to get some function back. So injection therapy, intracavernosal injection or penile injection therapy is injecting a medicine directly into those erectile bodies. So usually uh, with these medicines, if you want to have an erection, you take the medicine from the refrigerator, inject it right into the side of the penis. Uh, only after one injection, the chambers are all connected and that will promote blood flow to the penis. Um, you know, it, it, uh, it's our best medicine for erections. You say, what, if I want to get somebody erection, how can I do it? This is medicine's most likely to do it. Um, obviously the delivery system is not ideal. Using a needle, uh, uh, into the penis is uncomfortable. Um, I would say men describe this, that it, they do it. They say, it's like, uh, pulling the hair out of the back of your hand. That's what it would feel like. So it's a little bit of a mild discomfort. Uh, you hold pressure afterwards to minimize some bruising. And then, uh, you know, blood gets, uh, goes into the, uh, into the penis. Usually it happens in about five minutes. <clears throat> um, it's a, uh, like I said, it's a, it's a pretty reliable treatment. In fact, our biggest risk is something called priapism, which is an erection that lasts too long. Uh, after say three to four hours, your body starts to use up all the oxygen in that blood and then it starts to hurt because you're now having ischemia. At that point, it's what we call a compartment syndrome and you have to decompress the system or you'll, you know, you'll have long-term issues. So, to learn how to do this, we usually have it come to the office. We do a, a slow dose in the office. Sometimes we measure the blood flow with an ultrasound. I don't do it that often, but but some urologists may, and they're just checking to see how everything works. But again, you can then affect your dosing based on uh, on that um, to get the best response possible. Goal is to have an erection for about an hour. Again, this just shows you a cartoon how we do this. So it's an injection on the side of the penis here, and then that medicine. Uh, you know, the, the, the connection between the two main erectile bodies, there's a septum, which is incomplete. So blood flows in between both chambers. They, you know, they'll both expand. So you don't have to check both sides. <clears throat> and the way you go back to this little, uh, uh, you know, pathway of getting erections. So again, the bottom left is how do the pills work? On the right-hand side is how do these injections work? And so they work by the, it's fentolamine, the pavern, and prostadil, and they work through the cyclic AMP pathway, again, to create dilation. So you have different pathways to get a similar effective, which is improved blood flow to the penis. Uh, this is just an interesting, uh, uh, this is an advertisement from our local newspaper. The patient brought in for me and said, uh, do you do this? And <laughs> we, uh, um, just a word about uh, about uh, uh, shot clinics, and they're everywhere in the country. It's a big uh, it's a big business. Basically, what they do is you'll come into the office and say, "Do you want to know why I don't have erections?" You say, "Yes, I want to know why." They'll give you an injection, they'll do an ultrasound, they'll measure blood flow, they'll tell you you've got a venous leak or arterial issues, and hey, this shot worked. Do you want to buy it? And um, you know, you'll say, "Yeah, I want to try this. This looks good. I haven't had an erection in years." So they'll say, uh, great. And then they'll say, well, if you buy a six month, it's going to cost this much. And you get a discount if you do a year. Um, I've seen people leave uh, these clinics with a, a bill of sometimes two to four thousand um, dollars. They mark these medicines up at a tremendous price. Uh, they will uh, they'll assume you're not going to shop around and see what's what else is out there um, for urologists. Urologists who, who treat this, uh, you know, we we don't sell it. We're not. Usually we're not compounding pharmacists, but what we do is we give you a prescription. 
we send you to a company pharmacist, they'll send you the vial. It's usually about 90 to hundred dollars and that vial lasts you know, three to four months. And so, um, so know that your urologist does this. If you see in the paper, uh, the, the, these companies usually don't have anything that your urologist doesn't have. So, uh, you know, again, I would call your 24 hour hotline and see if you can, uh, uh, you know, connect with somebody there. Um, all right, so uh, penile rehabilitation. So again, the pills are very helpful. Uh, this is what we recommend, uh, or sorry, this is a, uh, I'm gonna pause for a second, I'll go back to the slide, you can just fix this one. But uh, so uh, this is a study uh, by uh, Raina's group looking at uh, following post-radical prostatectomy penile rehabilitation. Again, they took men in good erections, they used the, the uh, PD-5s afterwards like Viagra, uh, Cialis, we started that right after the catheter was removed. They did vacuum reaction device and they didn't use. And they did a protocol. And what they found is that about 70, 75% of men were able to have intercourse at six months, uh, you know, spontaneously without using all these medications. So again, good, um, you know, good evidence that this can help. So this is sort of a version of our protocol, which changes over time, you know, based on you know how things are for individuals. But uh, prior to surgery, two weeks beforehand, we uh, really encouraged prehab. And so again, using things like Cialis, uh, five milligrams daily to promote blood flow and health to that tissue, trying to <clears throat> bathe the endothelium and, and highly oxygenated blood is helpful. Um, vacuum reaction devices where you can do some stretching uh, and um, uh, trying to help with uh, 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 filling that space. Even if it's not oxygenated blood, it's really about half of what we see with, uh, with a normal arterial erection. There's probably some health to having that tissue stretched. And then maybe try a muse ahead of time. Um, use sometimes hard to get. Uh, recently has been a challenge. Uh, we have some compounding pharmacies that can sell a gel compound, uh, which works similarly. And again, uh, you can assess to see, do you get burning? Is it comfortable? Uh, so at least so that now you're ready for when the time is right that you can do uh, therapy. So once you've had your surgery immediately afterwards, uh, you know, I think it's a good time to start. So you know, if you're done well from surgery, not having issues, again, we consider uh, still using the medications like the Cialis. Once the catheter comes out, look at using the vacuum reaction device and the muse to see if we can get uh, some response. The vacuum device really just have you stretching the tissue out, uh, really not using the bands per se early on, but just again, filling that space with, with, uh, with blood. So down the road, looking about a month or so after the surgery, our goal ultimately is to get three to four erections every week. Um, and the vacuum device doesn't really count. Um, we want you to have blood coming in from medicines uh, or uh, one of the different ways that we can uh, uh, stimulate a standard uh, arterial erection. So um, obviously you're gonna check your blood work, check your PSA over time, testosterone may be helpful to do, uh, using the Cialis routinely, using the vacuum device, and then uh, using the L-prostyl and compound gel. We'd like you to try to get those erections and potentially use them. Uh, three months after surgery um, is really a time when we really start to push and try to get a better response. So if you're on your daily Cialis, you know, you talk with your urologist, sometimes we'll add a boost dose, which is an additional dose at the uh, right time. Um, you know, we're changing different medicines using some Cialis and Viagra and see what kind of response you get. Uh, again, same with the vacuum device and the Muse. And what we'll do is oftentimes we'll then start to consider if people are not getting a response using the injection therapy to see if they get a response. And then we continue to follow this over time. So many times your urologist will do this, um, you know, if they're robotic surgeons and their goal is for them to have the best outcomes possible, it's possible they will be implementing these, uh, these programs with you. Or find a, a, a urologist like in the sexual medicine society who can help. Uh, you know, there's, the, there's the, uh, those of us who want to help. Okay, so if none of this works, you've tried all the medicines and say you've waited, you've gone through therapy, you're now a year or two years out, you still say, you know what, I am not getting erections and I want to have erections. We have, this is an inflatable piano prosthesis, the, the three-piece prosthesis. And so this is the surgical correction of erectile dysfunction. And so uh, the way this works, you have a pump that goes in the scrotum, it's all done, it's put down by a small incision, but the pump is in the scrotum. There's a reservoir, which is behind the abdominal wall. And then the, uh, the two, there are two cylinders in the penis. They count as one. So uh, those are your three, three pieces. And when you want to have an erection, you pump the pump, which is in your scrotum. A fluid gets, it's a normal saline, goes through the pump, goes into the cylinders so that you then have an erection like this. You know, the erection as long as you want. 
uh, you have a, an hour, uh, uh, a day, a week. There's no problem with that. When you're done, you press the button, it goes back, the fluid gets transferred back into the reservoir, and the penis goes back to being soft or flaccid. And so, you know, it would look uh, uh, like this. And this is what it looks like when you, you can't see anything. That pump is completely invisible. It's uh, hidden under the scrotal skin. Uh, so here is somebody pumping up to get an erection. And then when they're done, you press it and it goes back down. So you go to be flaccid. So again, you know, other looks of how things look. So again, that person there on the left, if you're uh, at the YMCA and have a shower, you, you never know this person has a device and these are completely invisible. Uh, nobody knows who they're. So when you look and say, where are these being placed? So this is again, a cross section of the penis. You see our three uh, rectile chambers. Uh, we're putting these, these cylinders in this space right there, the two corporal bodies. They're not just sitting under the skin, they're in a defined space in those erectile bodies and that's, that's where we're gonna put them. So the surgery takes anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes. It's done by a small incision. For me, I do it in the scrotum, some do it above the uh, penis, uh, but it's an outpatient procedure. They tend to go home the same day. Um, and uh, once you heal up, uh, you'll have the ability to have an erection. So there are pros and cons to everything. So the, the, the upside of a, of a uh, penile prosthesis is it allows things to be spontaneous. Once you have a device in place and once you're able to uh, you know, learn how to use it, you know, you'll have an erection in 30 to 60 seconds. So you don't have to wait and say, gosh, I, my medicine, I took it, I got to wait three hours uh, for it to work. You know, you can be spontaneous. It's reliable. It will work every time. So it is not as though you say, gosh, I had some heavy fatty food and uh, maybe this won't work. You'll, you'll know it's going to be able to work. It's natural. Then it goes up and it goes down. You don't walk around like with it you know, the old fashioned malleable prosthesis that's always rigid, you know, this thing is soft. And we describe, you know, again, it's invisible. Nobody knows that it's there. So it allows you to return to intimates. Medicare covers this like they do for all procedures that 80% they cover and most private insurance as well. So again, we, we encourage men to uh, preoperatively use the vacuum device, again, to combat the loss of the penile atrophy loss of size that we see many men complain about, because I would say that's one of the bigger complaints is after a penile prosthesis, my penis is shorter than what it used to be. Um, so we try to use this to help with that. Again, same thing you've seen before, we try to stretch that tissue out. So what are things to know about penile prosthesis? So one outpatient procedure, do through, I do through a small incision in the scrotum. We dilate the erectile bodies to create the space to put those cylinders. So we're not like removing any tissue, it's just a soft tissue we, uh, where we place this. They come in multiple sizes, not one size fits all. They're small, medium, large, extra large, and supersized, which we call the Moyad. Uh, and that is a, uh, they're not called that, but uh, he would, I figured Mark would like that. Um, but they, uh, they, um, they do come in different size and we, we size appropriately to the uh, each person's size. Uh, we place each component separately. That's how we get all those things in there through one small incision. We put one part at a time that we make connections. Uh, we put a light pressure dressing and then usually we use this in about two months. Our success rates or satisfaction rates are 90 to 95% for both patient and partners. So, you know, people who ultimately get to this really uh, do like these, uh, these treatments. Uh, so we're in an orthopedic hospital. So here's our patients uh, next door to somebody who just had their, uh, their, uh, their uh, leg surgery and, um, you know, you can recover really well. But post-operatively what we do is we have a pathway. So much like your robotic surgeons who have a pathway for their surgery, those of us who do a lot of this type of surgery, we've got our pathways. And so we do specific things to try to make you as comfortable as possible afterwards. And so we use things like Tylenol and Neurontin, and we have a special local anesthetic called Exparel, which lasts for, for three days. So most men wake up and they don't even know they had surgery. Um, so again, you wanna work with people who have, have these sort of uh, plans for you afterwards to help your surgery uh, uh, work out well. So what you expect after you have a penile prosthesis, I call the first couple of weeks, the I hate Dr. Brady period. <laughs> Once the uh, local anesthetic works off, uh, wears off, you're going to sit there and go, uh, why did I do this? And so, uh, so men are uncomfortable. Uh, we put a penile prosthesis in usually uncomfortable on the tip of the penis and in the scrotum, but that does get better with time. Um, some people take a little more time, but again, usually most people are able to uh, use the device in two months. Uh, again, penile shortening is biggest complaint. So again, using the backing device and some of the uh, models of uh, prosthesis and, and some of our protocols help to minimize that shortening afterwards. Now, what are the risks? We've already talked about the upside. So uh, anytime you put any device or any kind of foreign body into the body, there's a risk of infection. So our standard infection rates used to be about 3%. Now they're down about 1% to 2%. Uh, and that's because these devices are coated with antibiotics to decrease the infection rates. 
Uh, the devices do have a certain lifespan. On average, they last about nine to 10 years. 75% uh, are still functioning at the 15 year mark. So they uh, uh, last better than most cars, but, uh, but you know, they may not last forever. Um, and the way they would fail is if, if they develop a leak in the system and you know, the saline leaks out, your body reabsorbs it, you won't feel it, but when you pump it up, it won't pump anymore. Uh, and, uh, and that would be uh, the typical fare that we see. Erosions are fairly un uncommon, but it used to be more common with a malleable device where they, they kind of wore through the tissue, but uh, not, not common uh, at this point. And the other thing to know is that penile prosthesis is, is really not reversible. So say, you know, I'm gonna try a prosthesis you can't then say, well, wait a minute, now I want to go back and try the shots or try something else because the, uh, these cylinders sit where the erectile tissue is. So, you know, I like men to at least consider all the other options, try all the other options. And if it doesn't work, this is a, you know, this really is a great option uh, for those where other things are not effective. Okay. So a lot of times, you know, penile prosthesis are good for life. So if you compare implants to other medical devices, such as like hip replacements, knee replacements, uh, heart valves, these tend to last longer than all these other medical devices that are implanted. So, okay, these are just for some of our patients who, uh, you know, I've done these uh, lectures for patients for years. So we kind of compiled some of the frequently asked questions that men have, you know, how long do they last? And again, you know, nine to 10 years is, a, is, a, is the average, but some last many uh, much longer. When you looked at Steve Wilson, who's really the godfather of prosthetic urology, did over 2000 implants, you know, so the five-year survival rate for, for him, his uh, series is 95%, and the 15-year rate averaged up, uh, ranged up to 60 up to 87%. So again, these ten, do tend to last a, a long time. Uh, another question was, can you or your partner feel a prosthesis during intercourse and know the difference? Um, I'll say again, your partner will not know that the, you have an implant in place. Uh, they can't feel it. They don't know the difference. Uh, they may become suspicious after a few hours, but uh, for the most part, your partners will not know you have a device. Uh, what happens if it breaks down or leaks? Again, say you do have a leak in the system. Again, you probably won't perceive anything. Your body reabsorbs that saline, but the device will not work. Now, if you want to have a working functioning device, we can remove the device and place a new one. So that'd be another procedure. Uh, if you say, like, I really don't care. I don't want to use this device anymore. You leave it in place. There's nothing that says that has to be removed if that, if that occurs. It's not like a silicone breast implant where it's a problem. This is something that really is not that big a deal if you have a leak. Again, patients ask, do you have to remove anything? I've had people think we're going to take out a testicle or take out part of the penis to do this. We don't remove anything. We use your natural uh, spaces to uh, place all the device. Uh, will this change the sensitivity of the penis? So um, this little cross section shows the very top, uh, you know, uh, right up here, if my arrow shows it, and you can see that those are the nerves that give sensation to the penis. So they're on the top side. So I'm doing my surgery on the bottom side. So again, I've not had anybody say uh, with standard straightforward uh, prosthesis surgery that there's any change in sensation of the penis. So you really don't expect that after this. Uh, will this be like my normal erections? Again, I would say that the erections are not as long as they used to be. So you don't tend to have as much elongation as you used to have. And then the head of the penis, the glands cap, that doesn't fill uh, like it did when you were younger. So these erections, uh, we try to get them uh, as best as we can to the same size you were. But again, I would say it's usually like the best erection you have, just a centimeter or two shorter. Um, questions about does it affect your ability to ejaculate? The answer is no. These are two separate processes. And uh, very rarely are there any issues with ejaculation after a penile prosthesis, maybe 5%. Uh, we usually just have to teach you to do it the normal way. Because again, ejaculation is a reflex. So you have to just the fact you have an erection doesn't mean you have climax. You've got to be roused, stimulated to get down the pathway to have climax. And then does insurance pay for the prosthesis? Again, Medicare does, many carriers do. Um, the code for this is 54405. So if you, you know, call the back of your insurance card and say, does my policy cover 54405? You don't have to tell them what it is. Just say that that's the number. They can look it up and tell you if it's covered. Oftentimes it's related to prostate cancer. It is covered. Um, you just have to kind of ask for that. Uh, and then will this be a problem for my wife or female partners return to sexual activity? Again, if you've not been sexually active for years, you know, you want to, we want this to be a, a healthy thing for both partners. So sometimes your wife's uh, or partner seeing uh, uh, their gynecologist sometimes doing things to uh, improve the lubrication of the vagina. Sometimes using lubricants can all be helpful and you can adjust how 
rigid you are, but the goal is to make it be pleasurable for everybody. So uh, in conclusion for erectile dysfunction, you have wide ranging options. You have you know, uh, pills and injections and, and whether it's an external pump or a penile prosthesis, all these things are reasonable options. Surgery safe and it's really is minimally invasive. Uh, we have high satisfaction rates uh, for both patients and partners with low risk. Uh, and it actually does cure the problem that you have. So you're not really relying on anything else. Uh, and that's the lecture there for erectile dysfunction. Uh, Dr. Moy had asked to go over some things about restorative therapies for erectile dysfunction. So these are kind of the newer things that are out there. So let's kind of review what's out there. Um, so the, the low intensity shock wave therapy is uh, stem cell therapy, stromal vascular fraction, and platelet rich plasma. So let's kind of go over these one at a time. So shock wave therapy. So we use shock waves for treating kidney stones, but what we found is that by using shock waves, some studies show that you'll get new blood vessels that get generated when you create this sort of uh, micro trauma and micro stress in the local environment. And then you'll get some stem cells and growth factors that get released because of this micro trauma. So, so what urologists started doing is they started doing this uh, shock wave therapy to the penile tissue and what they saw is, again, you started getting a neovascularity to hopefully get better erections. There are different types of uh, uh, delivery units. I would say, at least in my review, the radio wave therapies uh, are different. They don't have as much penetration and they don't have as much um, energy that gets delivered to the tissue. So you have less of the effect that you want. So tend not to be as, uh, as, re as responsive. So, you know, anything that has it, you know, call it, you know, radio wave or something wave, those are tend to be the radial release of this and, and you tend not to be as responsive. And this is what it looks like. So on the left side here is the focused uh, waves that go through, they penetrate the tissue to a, a, you know, up to 10 centimeters at a higher energy level, whereas the radial waves are more diffuse uh, and not as deep and not as much energy is, is released. So, um, you know, those are the different um, uh, types of, uh, of uh, therapy that are given. Um, they, uh, it's expensive. It's not covered by insurance. Uh, a lot of these private practices and spas will, will charge you 500 up to thousand dollars a session. And I've, you know, the patients I sometimes see will say they spent five, $6,000 to see if they're able to get a response. And, you know, those who ultimately see me really don't tend to get a response. So I may see a skewed version of that population, but that's usually what we'll see. So let's talk about uh, platelet-rich plasma, PRP. So what happens to that is uh, blood is drawn out, uh, blood is drawn from you. It's then centrifuge or spun down to uh, get the blood to separate into the cells and, and uh, the, the supernatants. And what they do is they take the kind of center layer that has uh, this platelet-rich uh, uh, layer, and that's extracted, and that's uh, sort of uh, processed with calcium, and then that's just uh, injected. And it can be ejected in different parts of the body. Uh, it is a uh, uh, orthopedic surgeons really do a, a whole bunch of this. They'll inject into almost joint or part of the body that hurts uh, and can be somewhat responsive. Uh, plastic surgeons are doing that. They, this one we found was called the vampire facelift, where they had all these little micro injections throughout the you know throughout the the face to kind of rejuvenate the face, and that's platelet-rich plasma. And so. Uh, idea there is you're injecting that to create uh, uh, you know response uh, and tissue recovery and, and done in the penis, and uh, and that's again being offered uh, out there. Uh, stem cell therapy, same idea. I like the idea of it sounds good on paper where you are uh, taking stem cells, injecting into the uh, into this tissue as a building block to help uh, replace diseased tissue. Um, when you take these in aggregate, you look at the, uh, aggregate. You look at these type of therapies. Um, you know, there, it, it, you can have where people are going to offer this, and you know, some people will pay for it. Our Sexual Medicine Society and the American Urologic Society put out kind of a position statement saying what we should be doing with this. We think that the therapies are really interesting, and hopefully, in the future, would be uh, something that can be offered. We have to figure out how to do it, how to make it work well, make sure it's safe, and so. Until these studies are done, the restorative therapy should be reserved for clinical trials and not offered in a routine practice. So if you go to somebody's office and they say, look, we'll do this injection therapy for you or do the wave uh, for you, we're going to charge you $1,000, I probably wouldn't go for that. But if you're at a center that's, uh, that's uh, studying these things, say, look, you just enter into a study, 
and we're going to track over time how you come. That's really the thing where I think I would look at and be uh, interested in being a, a patient there. All right, so that's really the, you know, that's the, the uh, this lecture, uh, you know, kind of focusing on erections and different things there. So I was going to pause there, leave it open for any questions, and uh, then we can figure out where that traffic light is and what's wrong with it. Um, you can kind of let us know what you find with that. Uh, a, what's wrong with it? And then B, uh, where is it? Uh, what part of the country? And I'll leave it at that. All right, so uh, uh, we, they've asked us also to talk about uh, stress urinary incontinence. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so again, uh, disclosures, no disclosures related to this talk. Uh, again, a uh, lot of different things that we treat in our clinic. Uh, what we're gonna focus on today really is, uh, is stress urinary incontinence. So again, prostate cancer treatment, a lot of times you'll be cured, you have side effects from all these treatments and we're gonna try to uh, improve your quality of life. And our focus uh, here is gonna be stress urinary incontinence. Uh, for those, this is a, I have an expanded version of this talk. If you use your phone, I go on this QR reader, uh, you'll, you'll have a, a longer lecture uh, if you wanna get into more detail, but we're gonna give you an overview of that right here. So lots of different types of, of urinary incontinence. This we're gonna talk about is treating stress urinary incontinence or post-prostatectomy incontinence. And this is after you've had surgery, you have damaged the sphincter, you'll have urinary leakage. There's also urge incontinence, which is, I gotta go to the bathroom real quickly, it comes out before I get there. That's the most common type that's out there. We also have overflow incontinence and, and uh, uh, mixed urinary incontinence, but, uh, but we're gonna talk about stress urinary incontinence. And this is a cartoon showing like, what's, what are the different types of uh, incontinence, what happens to those. But again, the stress incontinence is the far left. If you have something that stresses the bladder, if you have increased pressure in the abdomen that, that creates a press, uh, pressure effect, you know, then urine's gonna come out. That's what we're looking to treat. So how do we have normal continence and normal control? So uh, a stable bladder is one that holds uh, a certain amount of, a certain volume, a certain amount of urine at a low pressure. And that's called a stable bladder. And then below the bladder is the urinary sphincter, which is right here, if you can see on the diagram at the base where the prostate is. And it's a complex, it's made up of the bladder neck, which is the um, intrinsic or involuntary sphincter. And then it's the, uh, the voluntary or the extrinsic sphincter is really right here, which if you can see it is uh, that little uh, layer below the prostate. And that's what wraps around the urethra and creates control. And so those are what keep uh, us controlled. And when you have surgery, the intrinsic voluntary uh, sphincter is oftentimes removed. And you depend on that extrinsic voluntary sphincter and that's what we're looking at. So, and this shows you here where that arrow is that membranous urethra that's where the, the muscular, that, that sphincter urethra muscle is what creates that control for us after you've had your prostate removed. Because again, with radical prostatectomy, they're gonna come in and they're gonna remove, if you're, you can see the arrow here, right here in the bladder neck, this whole tissue here is removed. And then they'll take this segment right here and they'll reconnect it to the urethra right there. And this is the urethral length they talk about. They say, uh, is your urethral length good? The longer that urethral length is, probably means you have a longer sphincter as well uh, to give you a better chance of being ultimately dry. That's kind of the anatomy we look at with urinary control. So what can you do preoperatively to try to improve your outcomes with uh, control? So I know your risk factors. So if you are older, so if I take uh, groups of men, if I take a, you know, a group of you know, 40 and 50 year olds and they have surgery by a surgeon and then you take another group, say that are you know, 70 and 80 year olds and they're operated by the same surgeon, the younger guy's gonna have better control without question. Uh, it's just their tissue tends to heal better and they have, uh, you know, better long-term control. Uh, body mass index, those who are, are uh, not overweight. Uh, if your surgeon has to work hard and if he struggles in the operating room, struggle after the work. So goal is if you can lose weight. So some people, if you're waiting to get to surgery, you really, if I, again, when I was doing prostate cancer support, I tell guys, look, your surgery's two months out, get an exercise program now. You can lose 10 pounds, 15 pounds. If you go to that surgery healthier, you have a better chance of having a better outcome <clears throat> across all parameters. So I really encourage that. Um, and then if you have any other urinary issues beforehand, more likely to have those afterwards. So again, once you improve your diet, increase exercise, uh, Consider doing pelvic floor therapy, learn what that is beforehand so you're ready to get on that right afterwards. Uh, I think that's helpful. And then pick your urologist wisely. So again, like I said, if you, uh, just like for me, I, I do a lot of this type of surgery. I don't do any ro uh, robotic prostate surgery, but I do a lot of this type. 
you want to find somebody who's going to remove uh, your prostate, somebody who's done a lot of these. Um, and, you know, there are different numbers of what makes them experienced. You know, some would say in a, after they've done a, a 100 or 200, they're probably, uh, you know, very good. Uh, but you know, I think the more experience they have, the better off you're going to have in terms of your uh, your outcomes. And, you know, what they're going to try to do is do everything anatomically and if they can spare the nerves and they can spare the bladder neck and put everything back together anatomically, that's ultimate you want, likely get your best chance at uh, having good recovery. So again, uh, other thing you could look at, as I mentioned about that membranous urethral length, uh, what they found is that if you have had an MRI and you have, and they can evaluate, look at how long is your urethra, uh, you'll find that uh, if your urethra is longer than 12 millimeters or 1.2 centimeters, you tend to have a better control. And I can say from when I did, used to do prostatectomies open, I remember those patients where you could look down and you see, and you saw they've got a nice long urethra off the end of the prostate. It made the dissection for us easier. Uh, and those patients, you just kind of knew they were gonna do better. Um, and that still holds up today. So intraoperatively, so what can your surgeon do uh, that can help make you have a better outcome afterwards? So one, uh, nurse sparing. So prospective study looking at uh, uh, you know, nurse sparing status, and what they found is that if you had both nerves spare, uh, you know, we talked about this before, we can spare both nerves or just one nerve or no nerves. If you have both uh, nerves that go to the erectile bodies and they are spared, men tend to have a better uh, urinary control afterwards. So if you're uh, from a cancer standpoint, you can have bilateral nerve sparing, I would go for that. Uh, again, if you can have a bladder neck sparing approach where they really dissect out anatomically the bladder neck, so it comes down to a nice funnel. And then oftentimes they'll do, they'll reconstruct the posterior part of the uh, floor of the bladder to take tension off the anastomosis. And there are different names for it. Some people call it the Rocco stitch. But if you can, if you ask your surgeon, do you do a reconstructive posterior reconstruction? You know, they look at you and say they've never heard of that before. Uh, you may want to at least ask questions of, of some other surgeons. And then blood loss. Blood loss is another predictor of outcome. So if you have less intraoperative blood loss, um, then um, you know, you have a better chance at having immediate continence. Uh, you know, if you have a lot of blood loss and you have uh, bleeding as the case is done, uh, that just means you don't have good anatomic control. You may put pressure as the anastomosis is there. If there's bleeding uh, in that space and they stretch out the anastomosis and create problems. So when we look at those things, those the nurse bearing status, bladder neck sparing, and the blood loss are important predictors of uh, outcomes uh, for having good urinary control afterwards. Um, so again, talking about uh, surgery and radiation therapy in what order. So again, for those patients who have high risk disease that you may need to have surgery and radiation therapy, you know, what are we looking at? Um, again, those who had primary prostate surgery and then had radiation therapy added on afterwards, usually there's limited effect on urinary incontinence. And there may be some benefits to saying, when do you do that radiation therapy? So say you've had your prostate surgery and there's a question about positive margins. Uh, and, and your urologist wants and radiation oncologist wants to do radiation therapy. There likely is some benefit to waiting until you get the best control possible. Because say you're still leaking at the two to three month mark. If you can wait till you get control, maybe at six months or a year, and your PSA is still very low, and then add radiation therapy at that point, that may improve your, your urinary uh, control long term. There may be an advantage to that. And then if we look at incontinence rates uh, after surgery and then adjuvant radiation therapy, that's where we add radiation therapy after the surgery, we'll see incontinence rates are 15 to 20%. The erectile dysfunction rates are really 70, uh, 75 to 80%. So um, still 20% of men are getting erections uh, after that. So there's some uh, response there. If you do it the reverse, so say we take somebody who's got you know, high risk disease, they have radiation therapy first, and then they have recurrent cancer uh, uh, and they need to have their prostate removed or ablated. Much more challenging situation. The surgery is much more difficult. Uh, those who remove the prostate have a challenge. Uh, when you heal, we see you get these calcifications that form at the bladder neck and the anastomosis. Very often these men have recurrent urinary tract infections. Uh, and these are the guys that are really tough for us to treat. They'll oftentimes have bladder neck contractures. Uh, strictures will sometimes see fistulas. 
And when you compare the incontinence rate and the erectile dysfunction rate, it's really a different world. Um, so those who have radiation first and then get a salvage prostatectomy, the incontinence rates are 75% and, and sometimes higher. And the erectile dysfunction rates, 100%. Uh, all these men have problems afterwards with these uh, other issues. Uh, but again, sometimes this is the way that we need to you know, try to cure the disease. When we talk about how much or how does prost prostatectomy or post-prostatectomy incontinence infect, uh, affect someone's life, it is a significant impact on their life. When you compare prost uh, incontinence after prostate surgery, it is seven times more distressing than severe erectile dysfunction. So you know, uh, patients with these uh, interesting questionnaire, they look and said, how much would you be willing of your life survival to give up to get your control back, your urinary control. Uh, you know, these men, I said almost two and a half years of their life, they'd give up to be able to get their, their incontinence uh, managed better versus only four months where they give up for erectile function. So, so post-prostatectomy incontinence is, a, is really, it's a devastating problem. It's my favorite thing to treat because we really oftentimes can make life much, much better for you if we, uh, um, if we have a chance. So, Let's look at the instance of, uh, uh, of incontinence after robotic surgery, uh, looking at a high volume. These are high volume centers uh, in the late 2000s, uh, 2009, 8,000 patients, one year follow up looking at uh, stress incontinence, uh, uh, no pads uh, uh, at one year, 84% of patients. I mean, 16% were still incontinent at one year and then, uh, you know, zero to one pad. Uh, incontinence at, at one year. So they actually were wearing a pad that's 91%. So still 9% were incontinent if you use two pads as your marker for incontinence. So so our our rates of incontinence, at least in uh, 2009, at high volume centers was nine to 16% at one year. Now you may get some improvement at time, but that's, you know, that's the, a number that was there uh, from years ago. So when you're following a radical prostatectomy, what's your likelihood of delayed recovery of erectile function uh, and urinary function or urinary control? So if you have urinary uh, uh, control uh, issues at, uh, at two years, you've got a 30% likelihood of still getting some recovery of function. If it, you have it at three years, it's 49% of, uh, of having uh, um, uh, still having issues. And if it's at 48 months, it's 59% issues. If we look at erectile function um, at 24 months, uh, you know, you'll still have erectile dysfunction 22% of the time. At 36 months, 32% uh, of the time. And at 48 months, you know, still having issues with erectile function at 40% of the time. All right, so let's look at stress urinary cons and skin uh, exploration. So, um, uh, this is a picture of a patient who came in, you know, one week before his uh, planned artificial ear sphincter uh, surgery. Uh, what we found is we had to cancel the surgery. He had a severe uh, yeast infection and had this reaction around uh, uh, there. We had a secondary bacterial infection. So we had to treat his skin. And so we really have a program trying to minimize some of this before we go into surgery uh, ahead of time. So what are our treatments for uh, stress urinary incontinence? So we have everything from observation to clamps to uh, bulking agents to uh, uh, balloons and slings and sphincters. We'll go through these here. So after prostatectomy and you have incontinence, uh, observation is reasonable considering pelvic floor uh, training is reasonable. And uh, uh, the American Urologic Society and the SUFU Society uh, uh, give a moderate recommendation saying that it's reasonable to do these and see if, uh, if uh, you can help. And so um, oftentimes we recommend that most of the time you'll get that from your, your, uh, your robotic surgeons or your oncologic surgeons. Uh, we also recommend pads and clamps uh, for this. These are other options. And this is what a penile clamp looks like. I still have men come to see me who have been in content for uh, 10 years and never heard of a clamp. So I'm always happy if I can give a clamp to somebody or you know, show them that and they say, look, doc, that's all I need. My life is better. I'm good. I mean, my goal is not to do the most number of surgeries in the world, it's really to try to help somebody uh, have a better outcome. And this is what the clamp looks like. Uh, this is a Cunningham clamp. You can get this on Amazon. Uh, they're very easy to use and try out. And, uh, and I think it's worthwhile to consider using, even if you're early and after your prostate surgery, to use it, say, where you're going to go to church, you're going to go out to dinner or something, so you have extra protection, so you're not worried about leaking. That can give you some, uh, a sense of security. All right, so say you have incontinence after your, your radical prostatectomy, uh, when should you have a, a procedure to help? Um, 
So <clears throat> the American Urologic Society and SUFRU say that uh, if stress incontinence does not improve by 12 months, uh, then you know you you should then at that point consider therapy. Um, there's those of us who do this that if you have really severe incontinence, say 10, 12 pads a day, and it's six months after the surgery, we'll even talk to you about doing something sooner than that. And uh, and that's really just a discussion that you should have with uh, with your your urologic surgeon. Now, um, I would say just to, um, off the cuff, a lot of your oncology surgeons, the guys who do your your uh, your robotic surgery. They're right. I tell you, keep waiting. You know, it's going to get better. Give it time. Um, but, you know, I'm not biased in that. I'm going to tell you, look, you, you fall into this category. It may be an advantage for you to think about it sooner to improve your quality of life if you wanted to do that. But there's no, you know, nobody's died from incontinence. So you can wait. There's nothing that says you have to. But I think we have ways to make that better uh, should you choose. All right, this is a bulking agent, just to show you how we do bulking agents. This is uh, uh, the way it's oriented. On the back of the screen is the bladder, the urethra is coming towards us, and that's a needle at five o'clock. And what we do is we inject this material uh, under the uh, tissue and the lining to create bulking and to close that. That's a bulking agent to create closure. And um, we, that works well in females, like that picture is actually from a female, which I don't treat females anymore, but that was from about 15 years ago and, and it can work well there. But we actually recommend against it uh, in men who have had their prostate uh, sur uh, surgery. Um, it, it really doesn't work very well. Um, I, I can't think of anybody that ever did where they went, gosh, I am 100% better and happy. Uh, there is a chance of making it worse and it may affect our surgeries when we go to repair that uh, at a later date. So really we recommend it against bulking agents at this time. Uh, Proact, I don't have any experience with this yet. I'm interested to learn about it, but uh, Proact is you place these little balloons up the bladder neck. There's little injection ports that you can fill or uh, decrease the volume to create compression of the bladder neck. Um, so <clears throat> when you look at it, it's minimally invasive. You can adjust it afterwards, which is attractive. Uh, when you look at how dry were people after their procedures, only about 60% of patients were really dry. And the revision rates were at 22%. Um, and, you know, even up to 70% uh, at four years. And so right now, there's not any official recommendation uh, uh, for or against it, though I think it's something to consider and keep an eye on. That's the PROACT system. So let's talk about the sling system we have. So the current sling that we used uh, most routinely is the Advanced XP sling, and this is a, a picture showing what this looks like. Uh, there's a moderate recommendation from the uh, SUFU and the AUA uh, for this. And what this is is a mesh sling that is fixed to the urethra. We do this through a small incision below the scrotum. And then this mesh is fixed to the urethra. And then there's two small incisions on either side of the scrotum. that We pull the mesh up to tighten it. And so the way this works shows you a little cartoon of how we put it in. So we have a little trocar that we pass along the side of the scrotum. And then the mesh looks like this. <clears throat> it's the same mesh that we see with the females that, you know, the lawyers have uh, the malpractice uh, advertisements, but for us, we're putting it much deeper. We don't have the same issues that we have in females, so it is a safe uh, product for men, but this is what it looks like. Here's a, a, an image showing what it looks like from the side. So the urethra here is in blue, the sling is in black, and what you can see is as we pull the sling up, we have a rotation of the urethra from where it sits, rotating up into a, a higher position, and we think a more anatomic position where we get better uh, more anatomic uh, length uh, of the sphincter. And so this is a drawing showing, again, if we blow this up from the side, you'll see when this mesh uh, right here, if you can see my arrow is pulled up, what that does is it rotates uh, the urethra upward. And then here at the bladder neck, this is the length of the sphincter, which is relatively short. And then as we uh, pull up on the, on the sling, the functional sphincter length now is longer. And so again, it, we think it repositions the sphincter to work in a better way. And again, that's a similar thing here where you see that's the uh, sling being tensioned up and now we see the uh, lengthening of that continence mechanism to give control. And that was the male sling. And so the artificial urinary sphincter is for more moderate or severe incontinence. It can also be used for more mild incontinence as well. But if someone has a higher volume of incontinence, then we think of the artificial urinary sphincter. And this really has been the gold standard. We compare things to this, so everything is compared about the slings and other devices that are out there. You know, we try to see what we can do here. But when you look at 
outcomes. There was a recent trial done called the master's trial, and it looked at, you know, sling versus the artificial sphincter. And when you compare this thing to the artificial sphincter, the sphincter had a greater improvement in the overall quality of life scores, had lower supported uh, leakage and a lower mean pad rate use. So this tends to be, I think, a really great treatment for uh, those who have um, incontinence. So we, when we do an evaluation of incontinence, we do history and physical, we have you bring in your pads. Not everybody does that. We still find it helpful. We'll weigh those pads for you uh, to see what you're, how much you leak in that period. We do a, a cystoscopy, which is a flexible scope to look in the urethra, and we're looking at the coaptation or the closure of the uh, sphincter. We're looking for any scarring or contractures of the bladder neck. And then we do what's called a bedside urodynamics. We fill the bladder up, and then we have you uh, bear down, cough, sneeze. We have to do certain maneuvers. And then we look and say, how bad is that leaking? And then that helps to put you in, uh, have us put you in a category of what may be the best treatment for you. So here's just an image of a cystoscopy. Look in there and you can see where the, that's the sphincter, which looks pale and you can see a segment's missing. It's just a, it's a, not a healthy looking uh, sphincter. And this little video of what is a coaptation of urethra, and I'll show you this here, it'll play. Oh, but what, hap what happens is, is you'll see where the sphincter closes well and it will, You'll see that you get great, great closure with that. And that, that closure is what you want to have uh, uh, to tell us that, hey, your sphincter works well. So if we do a sling, that may be a, a reasonable choice for you. Uh, this one here shows where they, uh, they contract down and really it almost opens a little bit. And you'll sometimes see urine come out. And so we see that that looks like a very poor contraction of a sphincter that you know we give a rating a score out of five. And the first one we would give it a four or five. That last one we give it a you know one or two. So again, that helps us to predict are you going to be a better candidate for a sling versus an artificial sphincter. This is a patient who was set for surgery. Uh, so we we're doing a cystoscopy. We saw this calcification at the bladder neck. They did not have radiation, so it wasn't a dystrophic calcification. We took him to the operating room to look and see what was going on. And as we Manipulated, we found one of the clips from the prostate surgery had migrated into the anastomosis, so we removed that. Interestingly, this patient got better. I mean, I'm not sure why. Most men, even if you remove, they still have incontinence, but he got better, so um, we didn't have to do any other surgery on him. But we'll look for those things to see if we can make anything better. So with cystoscopy, again, we're looking for you know what type of uh, uh, what type of anatomy, what time, uh, what type of look does that area. Um, and we do a bedside urodynamics. For those who are a little bit, maybe have neurologic issues or something that doesn't sound right in the story, we'll do a standard or formal urodynamics, which is to look and see, does the bladder have uh, changes in there that are not normal, that we may predict other issues that may need to be addressed. Uh, but sometimes you'll hear a urologist may do urodynamics, but it's not standard for us all the time. So we try to figure out who is the best sling candidate. So if I don't want to, if I want a sling where I don't have to pump or do anything, uh, sling candidates are those who have less leakage. So if you have you know, less than 200 a day and the less urine, the better. Uh, if you have a good looking and functional sphincter on cystoscopy and no, no defects in the sphincter, and if you've not had any prior urethral surgery or any bulking agents uh, and no radiation therapy, that gives us a better chance and having control uh, with a sling. And our success rates of that are really about uh, 70 to 85% of the sling. And those who are poor sling candidates, therefore better uh, artificial sphincter candidate, are those who have the opposite. They've got more than say, you know, 400 cc's of uh, leaking per day. They've got, you know, bad looking sphincter and they don't, uh, they leak very with uh, minimal maneuvers. Uh, they've had radiation therapy. They're probably better candidates for an artificial urinary sphincter. Uh, and so we would go that route. And then to compare the two. So on the left side of the sphincter, right side is male sling. Um, you know, both are outpatient. Uh, both have a fully catheter or a drainage bag overnight. The artificial sphincter, you need to pump it to work it. The male sling, you don't need to pump anything. Uh, the sphincter is, uh, we turn it on or uh, delayed activation, we turn it on in about eight weeks. The sling works right away. So once that catheter comes out, you find out did it work or not. So you have that immediate gratification. Um, the artificial sphincter is probably better for severe stress incontinence, and also you've had radiation therapy, uh, and it's MRI compatible. Uh, success rates for the artificial sphincter are about 80 to 90 percent. For the male sling, about 70 to 80 percent. Uh, with a sphincter, you got to be careful with a fully catheter. If you ever go to the hospital again, they've got to put a catheter, and you have to have it deactivated, usually by us. 
uh, for the mail sling, there's not a big deal that don't have to worry about that. We have some different things we've used to try to minimize risks of issues of catheterization. Those patients that have the artificial sphincter, artificial sphincter we've used a temporary tattoo. Uh, that's, that's worked well. That was one of the reps from many years ago. He was a very great guy. Uh, he came up with that temporary tattoo. In our system, uh, we have a, a, an alert. So we put a diagnosis code in that says, when you go to the, our hospital system or in our uh, network, this comes up that says you have an artificial sphincter and cannot have a fully catheter because we have men who have this happen. They go to the hospital, they have a catheter put in and they have an erosion of a, of a good sphincter that worked well. And that's just an unfortunate thing. So we've now employed this. We've just gone to Epic. We're trying to get this uh, put in the Epic system as well. So if one of my patients in Florida ends up saying Cleveland, Ohio, uh, that that warning would fire in, uh, in their system as well. So that wherever they go, uh, that's, that's a warning for uh, those healthcare workers too. So treatment options for stress incontinence, observation uh, can do that, but won't get any better over time typically. Bulking agents really less than 25% improvement. I think it's really lower than that. The ball bar sling is uh, you know, 70 to 80, up to 85% improvement. And the artificial sphincter 80 to 90% improvement. Uh, and, and again, it's uh, wide ranging options. Treatment uh, is oftentimes uh, will help things. Rarely do they make anything worse. Uh, so again, it's relatively safe and we have high satisfaction rates for both. Um, uh, you know, again, men love these, uh, if anything goes wrong to them, they're calling us the next day saying, Hey, can we, uh, can we get these fixed?